Welcome back to day three of the social innovation track at Churcha 2020. I'm Priya Jmira and I represent the Nudge Center for Social Innovation. Uh, last three days, so many interesting discussions. My head is ballooning with ideas and things I need to read and learn more about. I feel like I have at least one week worth of homework ahead. Uh, so for the participants, if you missed any of our uh, uh, sessions from day one and day two, uh, please, uh, we, will sub, uh, we will post the links of the YouTube uh, channel, which has all the videos. Uh, you, can, we, you can also um, uh, follow us on our social media pages, um, where we, we will be sharing learnings and the YouTube links of all the sessions. Because we started a little late, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, social innovation track, that the objective of social innovation track was to focus on the long-term view about the sector and what do we all need to do to enable that view. Um, I will skip on what we did in the last two days um, uh, but, and I will jump directly to the session today. Um, uh, this, uh, the session that we are bringing to you today is a very important conversation about technology for inclusive development. Uh, how do we build technology backbone that bridges the digital divide and also helps improve the efficiency and efficacy of the tremendous work that is being done by the development sector. Uh, we have gathered together a stellar panel of entrepreneurs who have built multiple large organizations and have been on the front end um, of India's tech growth story. Uh, I will introduce the moderator, Pramod Basin, and then he'll set the context and talk about everyone on the panel. Uh, Pramod's career spans a, a professional and entrepreneurial journey in financial services and business uh, process management across the globe. He led Genpact as president and CEO. Uh, he led G Capital in India and Asia. He's also the co-founder of Asha Impact, a virtual fund which is focused on social impact investments and advocacy. Um, he has been the chairman of NASCOM and noted IT man of the year by Data Quest. Even though he calls himself accountant, I think that's a great way to kickstart uh, the session uh, with the IT man of the year. Uh, uh, please take it away, Pramod. Thank you, Priya. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I have a fabulous panel. I'll tell you, I couldn't ask for a better panel here to join in this discussion. Um, I won't go through introductions for each person, but I will request that perhaps as I come to each one of you, you could spend one or two minutes just on a description of yourself. Um, I, I, I thought I wouldn't do that and, uh, and move right into the discussion. Um, I think this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the world today. How do we use technology for inclusive development? Um, I, I think there's an amazing confluence happening. Finally, technology is getting so advanced that we can start to attack some of the biggest social problems in the world. And I'm not talking about technology for personal technology use and social media use, but really technology which can help solve some of the leading issues in healthcare, water, data analytics, pollution, all of it brought to intense focus by this event called COVID that is happening all around us. And the fact is that we are now globally interconnected as we are showing and yet at the same time, the world is going to try and break its supply chains apart in ways that are unprecedented and will certainly reverse some of the years of progress that we have made of working together. Within that, our own ecosystem in India desperately needs help in a thousand different ways. Our schools, our education systems, our healthcare infrastructure, the issues around water, the issues around getting information to farmers and agricultural areas, um, we can go on and there's no need to do that. I think we're all very familiar with them. But technology to me tends to be the only real solution that we have that can cut across many different lines and allow us to find far reaching and very importantly, very cost effective solutions that are being prepared and that we need in a country like India. We don't really have time to build the massive infrastructures that perhaps we need. Uh, we have to do that as well, but there's short and medium term solutions that we desperately look for. With that introduction, as technology being the core driver for inclusive development, I'll turn it over to my panelists. 
Um, what we'd love to do is speak for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then get into question and answer and answer some of the audience questions uh, and probably end just before 12 o'clock, just two minutes before 12 o'clock. Uh, some of us have to jump onto another call. But with that, may I first turn to Arvind Gupta, please. RNG, we, you and I have been discussing, you know, we've had many discussions in the past. Um, the topic that you mentioned to me in the comments that you had sent me was, how do we build local technology solutions at affordable prices, which solve the problems in India? So with that, I'd love to turn it to you. And then, um, Sharad, if you don't mind, I'm going to come to you after that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pramod, and um, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, quickly, I think the topic is uh, very pertinent because, uh, you know, as you introduced, Pramod, um, whether COVID or with, and with COVID, the, the need of technology to really uh, scale up, to deliver to a, more than 1.25 billion Indians, 1.3 billion Indians has really become even more uh, important and more pivotal in, in India's, uh, you know, journey uh, pre-COVID and during COVID and post-COVID. Uh, given that the local uh, technology infrastructure and why that's what important is something that I will mention. See, India uh, did a, uh, uh, and with no political uh, uh, overtones to it, India did a very um, uh, intelligent thing about 10 years ago. It started building out its own platforms. And they were not platform as a platform that we envisage today. But uh, given that the four or five platforms that come from Silicon Valley and three, four platforms that come from China, India didn't have its native platform of its own. Today, we have one. And uh, Curtis T and, uh, you know, some of this is repetitive. You have the Aadhaar platform, which not only does identity, but also do, does multiple things because it's so integrated, layered with many other things. Um, this Aadhaar stack or the India stack, many names it has got. It is the story of how a local platform, not only just local, it's something as a public good, which is helping India in multi, multiple ways. And let me just give you an example. You saw many countries which, which did, uh, which did uh, you know, interventions for COVID, special interventions for COVID, whether it was food coupons or you know, some, some kind of a, uh, income support uh, during this, uh, these troubled times. Uh, you had queues outside each of those government or semi-government offices to collect those payments or to enable those payments to come into their bank accounts or cash or food coupons, whatever form they may be. India, nothing of that sort happened. When the, when the Prime Minister's Garib Kalyan package was announced, th over 300 million people, uh, households primarily, got the money directly into their bank accounts without even visiting an office, without even filling an application form. So you had, you, you, you know, the amounts of money that were transferred instantaneously over two or three days were, were, were there in the bank accounts. And to put that money to work, they could, they could use multiple technologies, uh, whether it was a postal bank uh, to, to uh, withdraw that money if they needed to withdraw uh, using a Aadhaar enabled payment systems or um, you know, just using uh, plain old UPI to make payments to a person to person payments to merchants to buy goods to anything else. The long story short of this is from that India today has its own platforms, which is not only used by the government, but is used by private sector, by startups, um, by society at large. And, um, we, and you know, this is something that we control and we own. And unlike most of the other uh, countries, this is being put to use where lesser money is being involved um, to, to deliver a higher benefit. You know, the gone are the days when we used to talk about $100 going away from government coffers and only $15 of that reaching the end user. Today, if 100 leaves the government coffers, all the 100 reaches the last mile. It comes to their bank account. There is no attenuation in between. So um, I think uh, that's the story of success that India has. Uh, a very simple example also, I'll leave it and then, you know, let others comment on it is that um, how technology has been able to scale up. You know, pensioners in India, and if there is a lot of Indian audience, they will symbolize uh, with this movie called Munna Bhai MBPS, where this old man walks into a pensioner's office, strips himself as all of his clothes because the government officer was not signing his proof of life. Uh, I don't know if you recall that, but I, that's very a much. memory I have. And, you know, uh, once uh, that scene is no longer required because we have something called proof of life 
that can be given by a Aadhaar biometric. And today, more than three and a half crore Indians, uh, senior citizens, avail of that. They don't they don't need to leave their homes. They can go to an assisted center. They can just give their proof of life of what is called Jeevan Pranam um, certificate, and they get their pensions directly into their bank account. So, I think um, the India story of local uh, for for really solving challenges at scale. Um, a bottom-up innovation, making sure that every citizen is included, is is a is a remarkable story. And every day, this is coming to use, whether it's COVID, pre-COVID, or post-COVID, and it's it's only going to build upon that. So I'll just leave yes. the opening comments. Thank you, Arun. I'm going to come back to you on the platform point which you're making, which is very eloquent. You know, actually, I've always been struck by the fact that Aadhaar was built um, on a budget which had it been built probably in a developed country like the UK or the US would have been five times its size. And I think that's a representation of how we can build something fantastic um, at, at, at the cost that we can afford. But Sharad, you know a lot about this. Uh, you know a lot about platforms. But talk to us a little bit, please, about how you would, what, where would you focus in terms of inclusive development? But may I just ask also quickly, please, just a brief introduction would be great. Arun, actually, may I come back to you just for a brief introduction first, and then we'll move to Sharad. Yeah, hi. Um, um, I work at the cross section of, uh, uh, you know, worked in politics, worked in government, been lucky enough to be inside the government for many years, and been a startup tech entrepreneur for many years. So, multiple hats, multiple goals. I also teach uh, as a passion at IIT BHU. So, um, uh, you know, worked in Silicon Valley long enough to know, uh, you know, that de development there is focused on the top billion. And that's why I say India innovates for the top, uh, the, the next six billions innovation is going to come from India. Very good. Sharad, over to you. All right. So I'm here as an ice spiriter and ice spirit is a non-profit technology think tank run by volunteers. And <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, personally, I, may, I, may, I still see myself as a Unix kernel engineer. Think in terms of kernel, not the OS, not the application. And I'll come back to that analogy in a minute. And uh, but I've been I've done a bunch of things. I've been mostly on the R and D side and uh, been an entrepreneur. Sold a company to Cisco, and for the last ten years, you know, have been involved either in angel investing or uh, in stuff like iSpirit. So now, you know, what's the new innovation architecture that is becoming possible? So, and why is it difficult for us as Indians to see this innovation architecture? These are the two questions that I want to answer in my opening remarks, and then, you know, we'll come back to them if needed. So the innovation architecture that we should think of is a jugal bandi between public infrastructure and private innovation. Right, and that public infrastructure in India very hard to fix the, the 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 physical public infrastructure. Although that's improving rapidly as well, but we can leapfrog and have world class digital public infrastructure. This is what uh, Arvin talked about in terms of payments with something like UPI, digital identity. India is the first country in the world to have democratized digital identity. We have Digi Locker. We have. Now, something called the account aggregator for concentric flows of data, you know, probably the world's most advanced system of sharing financial data today. Health is coming uh, with digital public infrastructure in the same way called health stack and so on and so forth. So now the, the magic happens when actually innovation is digital public infrastructure and private innovation. And the easiest way to understand this is even something as simple as Uber. You know, Uber would not exist if there was no GPS. So Uber is public infrastructure called GPS and private innovation called Uber. And that reimagines how you hail a taxi, right? And so the Silicon Valley model, this is very clear to them. And why is it clear to them? Because if you are, let's say, a real estate developer there, you will wait for the layouts to happen, for the sewage to be put in place, you know, for the physical infrastructure to be put in place before you go out and build either residential or commercial buildings. Here in India, that's not the case. I live in Bangalore and you know in Bangalore we have many, you know, very nice apartment complexes. You know, where everything is world class on the inside, but when you step out, you know, there's a narrow lane that takes you to the road and the road is choked, right? So in India, we have traditionally said, hey, let's not rely on physical public infrastructure. 
because you know who knows when that will come let's just do our private innovation and we'll see what happens now in this model you never get scale you get scale only when the two come together and luckily as arvin pointed out india has the most vigorous program in the world today to build digital public infrastructure and it is coming up in number of areas so if if there is one takeaway i want to leave with you is make bets on that public digital infrastructure you can make those bets now you can be sure health infrastructure will work because the seven things that came before that all seven have worked <laughs> so so why would the eighth and the ninth and the tenth not work so make that bet that it will work plan on that working and then go for scale right from day one and that is going to be the model that we should go after uh, in the future so uh, you know we'll come back to this a little later uh, but that's my opening kind of uh, scenario here i think it's a very good point sharad i think the number of people who are not fully aware of what the possibilities are is immense frankly you know when nandan said up adhar his vision and imagination for what you could do with it was phenomenal and again we have so many other platforms the health stack being to me one of the most important where i think the world not just india but the world i think should see how these are being developed because no other country has these by the way at this scale and i think the benefit it can bring a broad group of people and it doesn't matter whether you're in a developed country or a country like india the benefits these can bring are absolutely enormous it's a bit like setting up the nhs in the uk it is wide ranging um it has enormous impact so i'll we'll, we'll come back to uh, come back to that kk i'm going to leave you to the last on this one and go to vinit first vinit uh, you keep saying you're an entrepreneur and not a technologist although you use technology for all your entrepreneurial benefit uh, ventures talk to us a little bit about where should technology focus in india how do you see it happening given the work that you do with avishkar and others uh, how do you see that happening where can we use it the best how do we bring it to uh, impact us where it matters the most you're on mute i think we need yeah, yep. thank you pramod and it was lovely to hear from arvind and sharad so i have not met both the gentlemen but i have heard of them yeah, so lovely to know everyone uh i think let me start with a namaskar given the covid times that's probably the best way to engage with everybody mm -hmm. uh, anyway we are all virtual so uh my name is vineet and uh, i actually am cha i chair avishkar group which uh, does everything from uh, microfinance to large scale impact investing on the other end so we do everything from 5000 rupees to around 100 150 crores of investments uh, our only goal is to Uh, work with the emerging three billion from the bottom uh, and create and harness opportunities for their going forward. Uh, and we have generally been focusing on entrepreneur harnessing entrepreneurial potential of individuals, either coming from that uh, strata or those who want to work with that strata and providing them high risk capital you know, of all forms and shapes. Now, uh, uh, I think uh, if one looks around and sees that is development necessarily uh, going to happen because technology will play a role. Uh, if you just look at microfinance and what uh, Professor Yunus did uh, by coming up with the idea of social collateral, uh, I think he basically came up with an idea which was as powerful as probably a trillion dollar. Uh, just the claim, whoever is bankable, is probably worth a trillion dollar in terms of valuation if you apply a value to it. Now there was no technology in it. There was understanding of social science there. And what role did technology play? Actually, technology did not play any role for a significant period of time in microfinance. Uh, but as microfinance started scaling up, as institutions, uh, you started realizing that there is a need for them to behave more like banks, and therefore, uh, technology started playing a role. And today, when you and I think, as as you all know, microfinance went from uh, less than ten million dollars in two thousand and one when I started investing in microfinance. as for the whole country so the entire india was less than 15 million dollars today i think our exposure is in close to 50 billion dollars so it's a sector that has gone it only works with the poorest of the poor allows them an opportunity uses all kinds of technology so the, today microfinance is cashless on the front end it's almost cashless on the back end which means it's no more cash logistics it's actually delivery and engagement of very poor people with an institutional structure that follows a process that follows a social collateral but does it all through technology 
So if you go to rural UP, Bihar, Assam, wherever you go, you would actually see cashless operations taking place right at the grassroots at the lowest level. Now this is actually one example which has been very successful and scaled up. Uh, let's actually start taking to the prime minister's uh, ask for, can you double farmer's income in five years? Uh, I met a young guy who was working with ICIC Bank, wanted to go back to Bihar and wanted to digitize, create a farm a grain bank, digitize one bag of grain. His claim was average uh, holding, and this guy is actually not necessarily coming from one of the top MBA institutions, etc. He was a very simplistic, uh, young, smart Bihari guy who simply said, listen, uh, the average acreage is very small. People produce five, 10, 20, 100 bags of grains. Uh, and the warehousing facility in India is 50,000 tons and above. So if you want to really do anything in terms of increasing farmers' income, you need to provide an opportunity for them to store, add value, finance, and do it. And it cannot be done with 50,000 tons warehouses. So what do you do? I want to create warehousing where farmers live, right next to them. And uh, this would mean that they will become miniaturized warehouses. And I will use digitization to convert each bag of grain into a digital currency. And then I can further trade it. We gave him half a million dollar uh, and 20, uh, March 2020, right in the midst of COVID, I have invested another $6 million. Now, what, is, what has he done in last five years? He has set up 40 different warehouses where any farmer with one single grain of bag can come. He can digitize the grain. There are certain uh, basic parameters on which the grain comes in. So it's paddy of this kind, 5% uh, is the maximum uh, 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 roughage that is allowed. And then you actually digitize it and then give him a passbook. It's a digital passbook as well. So his phone, he gets the passbook. And when he comes to take it, like we go to, my, we go to bank, deposit money, and when we take the money, you get a different note. Same thing applies. Uh, also, they can actually then allow uh, a lender to give 70% loan against the bag that has been put in there. Uh, to this farm, uh, farmer and then in six months time are delivering between 1.4 to 1.8x increase to the farmer consistently for five years. Uh, the reason why digitization is important is not just because to sell. The digitization is important because they are able to create value uh, with 50 and 100 very decentralized warehouses because of the digital. So when they are selling, they can actually simply sell from three warehouses and not need to pick up what farmers want to sell from individual warehouses, which will make it impossible for them to make money. So that's the kind of, uh, so very niche idea, very this thing. Just to give you an idea, post the reforms that you heard, this organization has the potential to become a $10 billion enterprise in less than seven to eight years. Uh, just to give you an idea of the quantum and uh, uh, the scale potential possible, and it actually has the potential to increase farmers' income by 1.5 times in six months. So I'll stop here just to tell you of what can be done, uh, both in terms of what Sharad said, creating this massive infrastructure uh, that is on the public platform, but also at the same time, the entrepreneurial zeal who has the instinct to understand the problem and doing it counts. What a brilliant story, Vinit. I, I think it's such a niche idea and how few people, I don't know how many others could have thought about it other than people who are really deeply embedded in the um, in, in these areas, in these parts of India, to have envisaged and imagined this idea. I'll come back to you because there are many areas like that that we should attack. And partly my question, I'm also going to go to Sharad and uh, Arvind on this, which is how do we pull a lot of these ideas together? Uh, one of the things I saw Israel doing extremely well is they pull their ideas together, they provide ecosystems to do that. And Sharad, particularly with I Spirit, is that something? Uh, that we could think about doing. But KK, I'm going to turn to you, if I may, please. Um, as, as the founder and head of uh, Mindtree, how do we Thanks use so technology for inclusive development much more than we've done today? How do we accelerate that? How do we make it work better? All yours. Thanks, Ramod. Uh, I think uh, great ideas have come from Arvind, Sharad, and Vineet. Uh, but what... Uh, Personally, I'm very excited about the role of technology is that uh, in practice, one has seen that technology is the only option by which you can really solve social problems at scale. What is also the ground enabling condition is that I think today, if you look at 
one could always think that India is very large, diverse, and there are unique problems. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the digital savviness uh, of a large population in India, you have 1.2 billion smartphones. Uh, there are 1.3 billion other registrations and close to 500 million plus internet uh, users. Uh, all of which give a very fertile ground to think about how you can implement technology initiatives to solve large social problems. Uh, the first thing needs to be that I think we should look at some of the large problems which we face, which can sometimes be unique uh, as opportunities, uh, and think about how you can intelligently leverage technology to solve these problems. Uh, so a lot of these thoughts and the conviction that technology can solve social problems uh, really came because as Mindtree and being one of the co-founders of Mindtree, I had the uh, real privilege of being associated with the other program, having been very closely associated with building the backend. Uh, and one of the key realizations we had was while well, technology to, in a way, set identification was really world-class. Uh, and you said it could cost five times more uh, if it had been developed in a developed economy. A developed economy. I just want to share it was not five times. We built it at a cost which was uh, one tenth of what uh, was the cost which uh, some of our global competitors had uh, sort of bid for that. Uh, that uh, the experience out of building Aadhaar and the ground level experience we got in terms of how you need to get on the ground experience to leverage technology. At Mindtree, we started looking at what could be large social problems that you can address and we took up the area of waste management. Uh, the reason why we took up waste management was when we looked at some data with respect to people associated with that badge, it was really stunning. In fact, the average life expectancy of a male was 39 years. Uh, the average life expectancy of a female was 32 years, uh, partly because they were not trained uh, and they were dealing with waste, uh, not adopting basic methods of safety. So when we looked at solving this problem, we said we must address the change management issues associated with training, giving people a sense of pride doing their job, uh, as well as leveraging technology to solve it. Uh, so the manner in which we went about doing it was to set up a cooperative of rack pickers. Uh, we started calling them waste management professionals, uh, associated an NGO with them, got an organization to train people on the need to segregate waste. So that was all what I call the change management associated. Now, Shifting on to the technology, we found that rack pickers are wandering around aimlessly thinking of picking waste. So the citizens whom we had trained, we built an application which is pretty much like Uber and taking on Sharad's observation using a public platform like GPS and the technologies available. Now, we identified a method of how do you send the rack picker or the waste management professional source closest to the waste generation source to go and collect the waste uh, in an electric vehicle which we gave them and really made their own process of waste collection far more optimal. Beyond that, we set up what we call dry waste collection centers. Uh, it's there in Bangalore and uh, many corporates like Coke supported us to set it up in other cities where we went. Uh, but the most important way in which we leverage technology was that for dry waste, we set up a marketplace. Because for those of you who are not aware of the value chain, the price for pet bottles may differ from an aluminum can to the cap which is there on a pet bottle. And many times middlemen were making money and the rack pickers were not getting enough value. By setting up a marketplace and encouraging corporates to come and buy in that, we really ensured a direct connect, like what uh, has been announced by the FM in terms of agricultural products, uh, between the dry waste collection centers and the corporates. Uh, 
and corporates like Unilever, Ultratech Cements, which were mandated to generate alternate energy, found a very credible supply of dry waste for their alternate energy sources. Yes. Yeah. And in short, I think the average capacity of the uh, waste management professionals uh, improved by 3x in all the 50 cities in which it runs now. So yeah. I think you can leverage technology even to solve a problem, but it has to be with a very defined impact output, which must be measurable. Now, that's the other yeah. learning which I have in terms of doing this. Fantastic, Kegan. Thank you for that. I, I think, I'm sorry, I'm just moving forward because I think, um, you know, I, I want to get a lot more in. And there are four, four such distinguished panelists that, you know, one hour is obviously way too short. But let me throw it back to all of you again, if I may. We have so many different pools of innovation, so many different areas where people are experimenting and finding great solutions. One of the great things that I saw in Israel is they seem to be able to bring an ecosystem together which works very effectively, where people bounce ideas off each other. They work very strongly with institutions. They work very strongly with government. So that that triple uh, network that they've built between entrepreneurs and startups and institutions and universities and government is very, very tight. Sorry, the fourth would be the venture capitalists. How can we do more of that today? We can upend the traditional way of doing this as we have done by building public platforms. That's really a model very different from what many of the Western countries that perhaps that we followed have done. How can we take that to a different level to pool in ideas and really attack very basic stuff? Poverty, you know, exclusion, um, health, the issues around healthcare. Let me turn that back to you. Um, let me come to you first, Sharad, if I may. I'll come to you, Arvind, and then uh, Anybody else, please raise your hands and we'll move forward. If we can keep the answers short, that would be great. Yeah. So we got to play a new game. And a new game needs new players, new type of players. And I, when cricket was five day and then moved to 20 overs, we needed an athletic Gavaskar, right? The old Gavaskar won't cut it anymore. And in fact, our cricket team, as you know, they had an under 19 program where the rule, it was, by the way, internally called the athletic Gavaskar program. And they told the new players that were coming in, if you, even if you're as good as Gavaskar, but not athletic, can't be in the team. Even if you're as good as Kapil Dev and not uh, athletic, you can't be in the team. And many of you know that whole program generated a whole new under 19 team, subsequently headed by Virat Kotli and went on to become quite successful. We know the story. This happened in hockey. Hockey, when you, you needed to be a good dribbler, when AstroTurf came in, you needed to be a dribbler and have speed and stamina. The, in, we fought the AstroTurf for 10-15 years, then our players fought the AstroTurf for 10-15 years, and it's only in the last 10-15 years where a new class of a hockey player has emerged that India is beginning to rise again. In your neck yeah. of the Pramod, this happened with wrestling. When wrestling when went from the mud pit to the mat, the wrestler changed. Now the point is the game has changed. The scalable game of philanthropic work, scalable game of NGOs has changed. And therefore we need a new type of a, of a social entrepreneur that has to come in. Now that is not happening right now. And why is it not happening? Because we are not recognizing the mindset that holds us back. And I'll give you an example of this. Today UPI does much one and a half times more transactions than American Express does worldwide on a single day and we are two years away where Indian UPI will do more transactions in India than MasterCard will do worldwide. And mm. yet when UPI was launched on February 13th, 2016, 321 people came to attend that launch. It was a, it, it was a launch in you know, Taj Vivanta in Bangalore. Only one of them was a VC and that VC mm. was Alok Goel of Safe. So we teased him. We said, where are your other VC friends? He said, boss, you know, frankly, even I am here because, you know, I am an ex-Googler and therefore I wanted to come. So we asked the many VCs, he says, why are you not there? Why are you not taking advantage of it? Their answer was, this is not like China and this is not like US. And although we created billions of dollars of value in phone pay, in many other companies, our VC industry actually did not partake of this at all. 
because we did not understand even as enablers of those entrepreneurs that the game has changed now of course, there is no problem now in the health stack vcs compete with each other to figure out how do they become part of this this is the yeah. shift that has to happen the shift that has yeah. to happen is we got to recognize that the class of problems that could be solved by building a new app you know new android app have been solved the new class of problems require a new os the new os requires a new kernel and the new kernel is coming from india the new os is coming from india and therefore you'll need a new class of apps that will come up and until the players themselves understand the story and until the investors in those players and the philanthropic partners in those players understand the story things will not change but i think we are at that cusp where we were in the case of commercial entrepreneurship for india in 2016 we are there for social entrepreneurship in india in 2020 so in the next 2 3 years are going to be the golden years for athletic gavaskars athletic gavaskars as entrepreneurs and athletic gavaskars as investors but it's going to be a very painful transition you know if you are successful you have no incentive to do that so you will very often see new players just like you have saw this happen There, there's enough new players. I think passionate, wonderful, Sharad. I think fantastic. Look, I am with you totally. I really think we do not have to follow old models tried elsewhere with different demographics, different circumstances. We have to come up with solutions that work for us. Arvind, I'm going to come to you because I think this is core to what you've been saying. And I think also this concept that everything must be done in the technology area by the private sector is such old hat that it really. uh to me also smacks of a very very antiquated way of thinking um but arun let me turn to you because you are at the heart of this also so so uh, you know uh, i won't repeat what sharad has already said but couple of points i think are very important number one um uh building on to what sharad said government itself has become a vc for the difficult areas where nobody wants to invest i think um, the 10000 crore start of fund um so the government is walking the talk uh and this is a very uh, mindset change in, inside the government and i think uh, the other changes that are required i mean the government is a uh, is such a big machinery that uh, you know either in times of covid you see it working completely or otherwise it's broken and um uh, two things uh, i want to uh, three things i want to mention quickly number one that covid did many disruptions and one of the disruptions that is going to be long term sustainable is the policy changes that covid has brought about uh, it gave the government a kind of a, a strong hand to make many disruptions health telemedicine was one of them you saw in two weeks a lot of uh, ordinances uh, put aside and you know or new new rules put uh, made for telemedicine for e pharmacies similarly what you've seen yesterday is uh, the essential commodities act completely changed the game and apmcs and many people have asked the question when will farmers be able to sell directly i think the ap the 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 deregulation of the apmcs will actually enable that happening um just because we don't need to keep talking about digital and you know uh, some of the big uh, stacks that and we can keep talking about it for hours i do want to mention another disruption that has happened is the thinking uh, what you talk about promote i think is very clear today we need technology whether it's prompted by the prime minister's office or the niti aayog or the ministry of it everywhere i think the first time when we start having a new problem and a solution to that the first thinking is get the, you know bunch of volunteers technologists i spirit nascom any everybody together let's solve this and that's a very collaborative effort that's a new effort that we are seeing uh 2 yeah 1500 please go ahead costs. 1500 laws has been uh, and this is a very big developmental issue we have seen 1500 laws which were holding up many many lower level courts uh, antiquated redacted uh, two we saw the announcement from the prime minister one nation one ration card again a very very core issue um, and it is built upon his one of the five pillars of um, post covid uh, relaunch of india reboot of india which is technology driven systems so again whenever things have to be done at scale the first thinking is let's get our technology uh, at work at play uh, and lastly um, uh, you know uh, i i think within the bureaucracy also there's a lot of fresh blood that is coming in within the government thinking there's been a lot of lateral entries that have gone inside the government 
And I think that is also going to drive a lot of change going forward. So I just want to leave it there. Yeah. Arvind, I'll add two things. I think one, we need to figure out how to do this at the state level also. I think it's very important. How do we get this into the states? Because it's happening at the central level. And of course, some of these things have to be tackled there. But for instance, health, implementation of the health stack at the state level, the analytics that go into it, et cetera. There. And education and training. The one thing we haven't touched on yet is education and training. And how do we use technology to really spread that? We are way behind in education and training. I will tell you, I am always appalled as how successive governments do not pay adequate attention to it. I don't know why. And this has happened for the last 30 years. Where, and so we are being left behind. So I really want to touch on those two areas also. Uh, Vineet, let me come to you on education, training, or whatever else you wanted to. How do we accelerate the adoption of technology to solve those problems? Because without education, for instance, no country can progress without it. None, anywhere in the history of this world. So we can easily abandon models perhaps that have been created in other countries, but then we must embrace something else very large the way we're embracing some of the platforms right now. Let me turn it to you and uh, KK. Uh, we don't have much time left sadly, but um, at least let, let me go through a couple of more questions. Let me actually very quickly touch on uh, points that Sharad raised. Uh, why are the VC not in the room? Well, because the VCs are not supposed to be in the room. They are there to actually, uh, the theory is greed is good. And I think post COVID greed is good is dead. Uh, I think uh, resilience with returns is going to be the new philosophy and sustainability would be right in the middle and center of all decision making. For all those who control capital and control capital is 200 trillion, ton, uh, 200 trillion dollars of capital that lies with what 0.01 or 0.1% of the world's population. And those people are not going to forget COVID in a hurry because that has brought the fear of God in their minds. So there is something called India had pioneered, uh, like many good things that we have done in technology, India also pioneered the concept of impact investing. Much before the world actually figured the name out, uh, the term impact investing got coined in 2008, but some of us existed in 2001 onwards. And uh, I think there were <laughs> when we decided to call ourselves impact investors. It happened in Bellagio in Italy. What has happened between 2001 and 10 was a survival of impact investing. 2010 and 20, uh, impact investing tried to mimic venture capital uh, instead of trying to tell venture capital that you should become like us. Uh, some of us who were purists continued to behave strangely and kept investing in uh, ridiculous ideas in uh, very difficult areas. But the rest of the world actually started trying to behave like private equity and venture capital. I think post 2020, what you will see is a complete reallocation of capital. Uh, the good thing is the world of capital knows the word impact investing. There is a line item now in your capital allocation. And what you would see is a significant movement of that capital towards impact investing. Uh, as you, have already, might, you already might know that Bain Capital, KKR, everybody has a now impact fund. I think between 2020 and 2030, they will be held accountable for using the word impact. Uh, till now, the cheapest thing to do is put in, I think to be an impact fund today, you have to just put in a suffix uh, uh, called impact behind your name and basically produce a $20,000, $50,000 report uh, for a $2 billion fund, which is quite cheap. I mean, I can do it uh, even in a lesser fund as well. Uh, to create real impact requires audacious decision to be taken to uh, have a hundred times better understanding of what is happening on the ground and not to put the old wine into a new bottle and call it impact investing. So what I am predicting is the world is going to create a very large amount of capital that would seek impact. And because this is large amount of capital, it will ask, seek accountability and ask what is your strategy to be different? Because today in India, that is not very different. I mean, my follow on investors are Axel, Chirate and others. So if Avishkar makes an investment, uh, somebody has asked this question, do India has an app that can actually do this? Well, India has lots of apps to have for farmers to do very different things. Uh, and a lot of investors are actually now the, the mainstream venture capital investors are following through in a lot of these companies. Uh, some of it, unfortunately, they think is technology. What they don't understand, and this is what I would actually keep telling people, that UPI's success is because you understood a problem and you came up with a solution. Uh, it is not because of technology, but technology played a very critical role because those who were trying to solve the problem first understood the problem. 
I think similarly, if you want to apply technology in agriculture or waste, KK got talked about a beautiful example. We actually build a 500 ton per day waste management company from scratch in six years time with, can you believe it? $7 million, uh, six, uh, actually $4 million investment from zero to a turnover of around uh, $70 million in six years time, uh, 500 tons per day. And it is still just in three cities, just in three cities can become a billion dollar company in the next four or five years. Capital thought process can go a long distance by using technology. And I completely agree with Sharad and Arvind's point that technology, both public and private, has a very important role to play. But uh, without understanding the problems and coming up with the right solutions, technology, which is a very massive enabler and can actually create new business models, uh, would not make a difference if people just burn money to seek growth at all costs. And I think that's really the fear I have right now. When venture capitalists who don't understand uh, the problem solving on the grassroots walk in. The other, other important point, which I think we keep missing on, is growth is important, solution is important, but you are also playing with the lives of very vulnerable folks, whether it is small time farmers or, or uh, waste picker or uh, a very poor person in microfinance. We need to actually create much more responsible and empathetic boards of the companies who understand the real life. I mean, today in this world, post COVID, when India is locked down, uh, if we go in the market and start trying to extract every penny out from whatever is left with people, we will have a revolution taking place. So we shouldn't actually be contributing in a negative way as well. So I'll just stop here. Yeah, well said, Vinit. I think the one point you're making about, you know, impact investors not trying to behave like VCs is an important one because we tend to replicate or try the same thing over and there's no need to. We have to find new model and different models. I'm going to circle up very quickly. KK, I'm going to come to you for a few remarks. Maybe on education, I'd love to get your thoughts. Uh, and then circle back to everyone just for two minutes. How do we significantly accelerate this uh, entire adoption of technology to drive inclusive growth? Um, just a few thoughts on that, just a minute each. And then I think we'll have to, in fact, close. But KK, let me come to you very, if you could be, if I could ask you just for a, minute or two to talk about either education or how, where else should we apply tech, the develop, uh, in, uh, technology for inclusive development? Uh, Pramod, I'll comment on the second point. Uh, uh, I would think if you want to drive innovation, you rightly talked about the Israel example, which is very government driven. But I think in the Indian context, because of the diversity of the problem and the need to find unique solutions, I think private enterprises should come in to play that role of being a convener to solve the problems. Uh, again, sharing from my experience in NASCOM Foundation, one of the key themes is to drive technology for social good. I think the annual process of having a contest, identifying the top five uh, interesting ideas and really mentoring and supporting them to reach scale, uh, I think has really worked. Uh, so based on my experience, uh, uh, my process would be to encourage private enterprises to take a role in solving very specific areas of problem by engaging at the ground level and trying to scale that up. Very good, KK. Okay. Um, let me go around to everyone, please. What else would you do? How do you bring all these ideas together? What can we do to bring them together? Because we have so many different pockets of ideas. Um, Sharad, your passionate discussion that you were having about uh, building a new game. What is the new game we can come out with over here? How do we build out that new game? What can we do to accelerate the, what can we do to accelerate the momentum we have? So I'm going to go around again, please, uh, very briefly, because I think we only have about three or four minutes left in total. Uh, Arvindji, what do, you, what do you think? How do we bring all these efforts together is my core point. Because scalability remains a challenge. We have tons of great ideas, for instance, on apps for farmers, for waste, for many things. And yet, achieving scale has been a problem. Israel does a masterful job at this. Many other countries do. Singapore does it. By the way, Scandinavian countries also do very, very well in these areas by bringing all the people together. I wonder how much more we could do by bringing all the participants together. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think uh, the two points I would, the three points I would quickly make uh, in the interest of time. Number one, 
we have to involve, uh, to your point, the federal and the state governments together. It's a federal structure in India, and a lot of these problems, we have to have um, enough people, good leaders, uh, political leaders, bureaucratic leaders, working in tandem. Two, uh, I, and I think that's where uh, India does well, by the way. I mean, uh, technology is one area, digital is one area, innovation is one area that everybody wants to grab a piece of the pie. I think we just need yes. um, you know, better coordination. Two, I think um, some of the comments, and I'll respond to that comment also, that I think we have to also understand the notion that uh, uh, rural India today, and especially with reverse migration happening, is no longer digitally unconnected. We have 660 million unique internet users in, uh, in India, and all of them don't live in cities. So there is a, a, a very uh, non-urban resident in India, which is very much connected. Um, they probably don't have that much buying power. So, you know, we'll have to think more innovatively how to serve that audience, uh, bit sizing your, your transaction, bringing it lower and, and serving that audience. And lastly, I think we do need a disruption in, um, in how we fund these massive uh, things. It's glad that what Vineet is saying, what Sharad is saying now, the VCs are participating in this. But the initial resistance, uh, whether it's uh, impact investing or VCs, they do want to come in at a later stage. So what if what Vineet is saying is if people want to participate, they have to get uh, participate at a very, very early stage. And we have to think how to disrupt at that stage itself in terms of yes. money money into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, Arun. Um, Shalad, I'm going to come to you because I think what I what I was hoping that with the backing of someone like iSpirit, which is a, a nonprofit, is there a way to pull many more pieces of the puzzles together and create a much larger forum? Uh, which allows young startups, entrepreneurs, old entrepreneurs, old codgers like me to come together, leverage off each other and build scalable um, solutions. Absolutely. And I think the place to start is reimagining. So, for example, in the case of credit, you know, and I see our goal with iSpirit is to keep it small, but allow many more iSpirits to come up because we can only do a handful of things. But one of the things that we are doing is reimagining credit in India. And, and so good. clearly MFIs have done a very good job. They're roughly about, you know, hopefully as things go well, they'll be in the range of about two lakh crores as the loan book. But the reimagined credit, which is a cash flow lending, flow based credit in the, and you can hold me, I'm saying this publicly in by end of next year, in less than 18 months will be bigger than what microfinance has achieved in 20 years. Now that's yes. why reimagining everything entirely. Now this, vision of democratizing credit at scale brings a lot of people together but it also has incumbents who fear it similarly in health you know we know diagnosis covid is a great example you can't diagnose by looking at the symptoms you got to do a test you know you all the diagnosis will be biomarker based and not symptom based okay, the question is can india be the first country to make biomarker based diagnosis available to every Indian at a scale that has not been imagined anywhere in the world? The answer to that is yes. And those kind of visions then bring people together and then everybody has a reason to participate in it because everybody has a piece of the pie that they bring to the table and that mosaic comes together and people move forward. And I think in those places where we are able to tangibilize a credible, such credible vision which looks feasible, then it brings people together and we need to do more of that as we go forward. And I am quite confident that I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that is starting to happen and that will happen at a larger scale as we move forward. I think you've heard two very important points. You know, democratizing credit remains one of the golden opportunities, I think, because uh, financial inclusion stakes in India are still so low, so few people are included. And yet it's obvious that many of them should be great credits and we have no ways. Of it. So I, I'm delighted you're doing that. Um, Vineet, um, let me come to you. How do, we, how do we drive scale across the board in many of these areas? I think the word reimagination that Sharad used is quite powerful. We, uh, I think uh, most folks here probably do not know, but uh, we since 2009, uh, we have been actually organizing a forum called Sankalp, Sankalp Forum in India, Indonesia, and Africa where we pick up the young and the bright and actually not only fund them, but uh, pick up 30 people, get all investors from across the globe. So we get physically 50 countries to participate in India, Indonesia, and uh, Africa every year. 
uh, and India is actually the center of the universe of social entrepreneurship in that sense. Uh, yes. Companies have been actually scaled up through that process. Uh, I would actually seek uh, involvement of Arvind, Sharad, and KK as well, and probably promote. You have some idea about what we have been doing because of Asha of involvement as well. Of course. Uh, but uh, this actually is a movement. So when we reimagine, uh, Sharad talked about uh, the micro, small, medium enterprise space. Since 2010, we have been actually investing. I mean, we have actually a $150 million portfolio in just MSME space. Very small, uh, unlike microfinance, which was able to scale up. But microfinance took its time. It actually also took its time uh, to scale up. MSME portfolio, because of inherent risks and lack of understanding of cash flow based management and some other complications that exist, uh, has taken much longer. But my belief is with the fintech revolution taking place on one side and non banking finance companies realizing that collateral based space has been taken up by the banks, uh, both public and private sector. The only way for you to survive and build a much larger portfolio is to be an MSME. And you need to do things differently than how you have been doing. Uh, so uh, I personally believe that uh, there is a movement that is possible. I think what I need, and I have been actually trying to implore on the government also to understand that impact investing is very large. It is the future. And the world, the Americans and the Europeans have actually taken the moral high ground by claiming that impact investing is theirs while it was created by India. So we are actually going through the yuga route where somebody else has actually publicized it. Impact investing originated in India is still the strongest and largest in India. And if you are any player anywhere in the world, you have to play it in India. But the government doesn't recognize it. Uh, I have made all possible potential efforts to convince. Uh, but I think there is still lack of acknowledgement and they still see yeah. the enterprise as an anathema. Uh, they don't see that yeah. positively. So that fight continues. Think- Stock exchange, which is being discussed. Uh, there is another battle that is going on there as well. But uh, I think we'll- I, I think we have to build our own models. We need. We have to build our own models. I think we ourselves have to get out there much more than perhaps we have, and just make sure that it's framed in the context of what we're doing here. KK, I'm going to come to you for one minute. I may have to leave, folks. And uh, uh, Priya, can you come in because I've got another session starting. Um, and uh, but KK with. May I ask you to take on? Yeah, in 30 uh, seconds, I'm close. just going to sort of give my uh, view. And okay, thanks, Pramod, for doing a fabulous job as usual. Thanks, uh, this. Uh, what I just want to say is, I think we need to have a set of very sharply defined problems. And beyond government, private enterprises like Nudge, like Nascom Foundation need to take ownership of each one of these areas, get all the stakeholders together and ensure that, like Sharat mentioned, we reimagine the specific area and how do we really set up new solutions which are technology enabled, which are not yes. really driven by technology, like uh, what we need said. Uh, yes. And how do you share the success of it? Today, I think we have very few forums to share the success and how do we learn from each other? I think these are the two initiatives which will really drive scaling of some of this. Yes. I don't know how important it is. Sometimes it's very important. I think we also need to learn to market the things that we do so well. Impact investment, building these wonderful platforms, what MyGov is doing with the, uh, with, with, within the government. There's astonishing uh, innovation that has happened in our country. Perhaps we need to also make sure that our voices are heard and we define those agendas better. Couldn't have asked for a better panel. Priya, thank you for setting it up. Uh, thank you, Vineet, Arvin, Sharad, KK. Right. It's been you, such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you for the panelists. Um, and Pramod, thank you for doing such a great job to bring all the different opinions together. Um, and uh, it's been amazing Fabulous to panel. hear from all of you. Uh, I will thank now you. request Gopi to step in uh, as our next uh, speaker. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to cover a lot of the questions that came. And I'm hoping that Gopi can cover some of these questions, uh, because they're quite relevant. Um, it would be great to uh, have you close out uh, this conversation um, and uh, take it, take the social innovation track to its conclusion. <laughs> 